Hello, my friends. Today we are reading chapter 16 of Night of the Spade Foot Toads. If you're following along with me, we are beginning on chapter or page 174. Did you know the ice fish and the Antarctic Ocean have their own antifreeze? If they didn't, they'd be ice cubes. And did you know it gets so cold down there that your skin would freeze in only a minute? Ben tries to look interested, but to tell the truth, he is sick of hearing Ryan's geography report. The bus stops and a few kids get off. Ryan babbles on about Antarctic squaws and Adelie penguins. Ben is wondering how much longer it will take on the bus to reach school when he hears a low chant coming from the back of the bus. Someone laughs. The chant gets louder. Ben can't make out the words, but he can tell that more kids have joined in. He turns around. Frankie Murley is in the back of the bus leading the boys in the back seats in the in a dumb sing-songy chorus. Captain Kid the Snake Man or and Snake Man. Captain Kid and Snake Man. Ryan is finally has finally heard it too. Frankie's such a jerk, he mutters to Ben. Before Ben can stop him, Ryan stands up in the aisle and shouts in the same sing-songy way. Frankie's such a jerk. Frankie's such a jerk. He even yells louder than Frankie and the kids on the front of the bus stop talking and turn around. When the bus slows down for the next stop, Frankie makes his way up the aisle and pushes Ryan back into the seat. Say that again, matey, he says, holding one hand over his eye like a patch. Ben's heart pounds. Stop it, he says. Oh, look, snake man can talk. Frankie turns around to make sure the other boys are watching. He makes a rattling sound with his mouth. Leave Ryan alone, says Ben. You started it with a stupid chant. What'd you say, Captain? Do you want me to leave you alone? Frankie tries to yank Ryan's glasses off, but Ben knocks his hand away. The glasses with the patch hang lopsided halfway down Ryan's nose. Ben has had it. Without thinking, he climbs over Ryan and lifts Frankie up by his jacket, pushing him back down the aisle. Hey, the bus driver shouts, enough of that, everyone in your seats. Suddenly, everyone is yelling and hooting. Leave him alone, Ben screams, leave my friend alone. Ben's eyes fill with tears, but he doesn't care if anyone sees. He gives Frankie's jacket another shake and shoves him in his seat. The bus driver pulls the bus to the curb and lurches down the aisle. You boys settle down or you'll be walking to school for the next month. Everyone on the bus is quiet now. Ben drops down on the seat next to Frankie. Sorry, he says to the bus driver. I'd better not hear another word out of you two. The bus driver glares at them, then returns to the front. As soon as the bus pulls away from the curb, Frankie snorts in disgust. I'm glad I'm moving. This school and all the losers in it like you stink big time. You're moving? Ben can't believe what he just heard. You're leaving? When? This summer, Frankie said, I wish it was tomorrow. Who wants to live in this crappy town anyway? Ben tries to hide a smile. <laughs> good luck. What do you mean? Frankie says. I mean, good luck being the new kid in a different school. You better hope that wherever you move, the kids are there are nicer than you because you've been a real creep. Yeah, Ryan is up on his knees, looking over the back of the seat. I hope the overtoad eats you up. Danny Martin chokes back a laugh. Frankie glowers at him and Danny whirls around to face the front. At the next bus stop, Ben heads back to his seat. One for the overtoad, he says to Ryan. Yeah, one for the overtoad. Ryan gives Ben a huge goofy grin and picks his, up his backpack. Gotta get off here, but I'll see you tomorrow, he says. We'll have a blast. See you, Ryan. Ben watches out the window as Ryan gets off the bus and heads across the street to his house. Ben is still shaky inside from the encounter with Frankie, but he grins. He can feel people looking at him, but it doesn't bother him at all. Then he remembers his geography report. His stomach rolls over once, then settles into a dull churning. Hey, his father is standing at the door of Ben's room. Agatha is beside him already in her pajamas. Hey, Ben says, placing his arm over the notes of the, and the desert pictures scattered on his desk. How's the report? Pretty good, Ben says, hoping that will be enough for his father. His dad plops down on Ben's bed and pulls Agatha onto his lap. Ben cringes. This is not good. Your mom thought maybe we ought to take a look at it and see if we can help you finish it up. No, the 
that's okay, Ben says. I can do it. Actually, I'd like to see it. It's quiet for a couple of seconds. Ben points to the papers on his desk. Here it is. Those look like notes. Can I see what you've written? Well, I haven't really written much yet, Ben mutters. He fumbles for something else to say, knowing the truth is about to come out. To make matters worse, his mom sticks her head in the door. Bedtime, she says. Ben's showing Dad his report, Agatha says, except he doesn't have it. Ben gives his sister a hard look. Why don't you go jump in a lake, he says. Because I don't want to, Agatha says. You're the one who's in Agatha enough. Dad lifts her off his lap and puts her on the floor. Have you written anything, Ben? Not much. Ben, you told us you were working on it and we trusted you, his dad says. Haven't you even started writing? Ben shrugs. Uh-oh, Agatha says. Now Ben's in trouble in a bunch of ways. Shut up, Agatha. Ben wants to strangle his little sister. What do you mean, a bunch of ways, his mom asks. Should I tell them? Agatha keeps her eyes on Ben, but edges closer to her mother. No, Ben says. Okay, 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 says his father. What's happening? Ben got in a fight and almost got us thrown off the bus. I did not. Did so. The bus driver says you're not supposed to fight on the bus, and you did. Agatha, Ben yells. Enough, enough, their father says. Agatha, go with mom. Agatha sticks her tongue out of Ben as mom drags her out the door. Ben, what is going on with you? There's so much going on in his head, Ben doesn't know where to start. Is this about Mrs. Tibbetts, his dad asks? Is that why you're not doing your work? No, actually, it is about Mrs. Tibbetts, but it's also about Frankie and Ryan and the speedfoots and Mrs. Tibbetts' sister-in-law and the man with, from the National Heritage Program and being new. His father sits on the bed, holding his head in his hands and staring at the floor. Sorry, Dad, Ben says. His father looks up. What are you going to do about your report? It's Wednesday, and isn't it due on Friday? I'll finish it tomorrow, Ben says. Just make sure you get it done. His father stands and comes over to Ben's chair. If there's anything I can do to help, or is there anything I can do to help? Ben shakes his head. I love you, pal, his dad says. I know, Ben says. Thanks. It starts you're getting through classes the next morning. Every time Ben thinks about the report, his stomach clenches up. While Mrs. Kutcher is writing something on the board, Jenny turns around to in her seat. I heard about the fight, she whispers. It wasn't a fight, Ben says. It sure sounded like a fight. <clears throat> I noticed Mr. Loudmouth is pretty quiet this morning. Ben looks back toward Frankie's desk. Frankie is staring right back at him, but he jerks his head down the moment Ben meets his gaze. Ben doesn't really care about Frankie. He's got more important things on his mind. The pool in the woods behind Mrs. Tippett's house is surely gone by now, but he'll just have to stop worrying about that problem and hope he and Mrs. Tippett's can convince Mr. Lindsay that there really were stage foots in the pool. Now he needs to concentrate on his report. He can get more stuff off of the internet, and after school, he can go down to the town library. He can even ask his mom and dad for help. He could also draw a map of the area. Maybe he can pull it off. He feels better. He can do it. Ben crams his books um, and his desert note cards onto his back or into his backpack. It's almost time for dismissal. Hey, Ben, Jenny says, looking back over her shoulder. Yeah? See you this afternoon. Uh, what for? Well, you know, Ryan's party. What? Today is Ryan's party. I know he invited you. You're coming, right? Ben remembers the party hat invitation that he had stuffed in the papers of his desk. He feels like he might throw up. Is your mom bringing you over? Ugh, I don't know, Ben stampers. I, I guess so. Okay, then. See you there. Jenny disappears into the crowd of kids, leaving the classroom. Um, Ryan sits in next to Ben on the bus. He's so excited about his party, he can, or he's talking even faster than usual. Ben smiles like he's listening, but his mind is all over the place, trying to figure out what to do. Ben finally interrupts the nonstop chatter. Ryan? Yeah? I can't come today. What? I'm sorry, I can't come to your party. I haven't done my report. I'm pretty much grounded until I finish it. I'm really sorry. But 
but you said you were coming. You said my mom didn't need to call. I know. And I was coming. I totally forgot it was today. And if I don't get this report done, I'll be in big trouble. You've been working on it for weeks. Can't you just finish it after the party? I can't. I've barely even started in, on it. But my mom's already ordered pizza and everything. That's okay. There'll be more for everybody else. Come on, Ryan. I said I'm sorry. You'll have plenty of fun without me. Ryan turns his back to Ben and stares out the window. When the bus pulls up to Brian's stop, he squeezes past Ben and trudges down the aisle. Ben watches him as he steps onto the sidewalk. Ryan takes off his glasses and rubs his shirt sleeve across his eyes. He glances up at the bus window. His lazy eye looks off to the left like he's watching someone in the street. But the other one looks straight at Ben, hurt and sad. As at the top, Ben climbs down from the bus and walks toward his house. Agatha trails alongside him. I know something you don't know, she sings. I know something you don't know. Ben tries to ignore her, but she still sings it louder and louder. Finally, Ben turns to face her. Okay, already, I give up. What do you know that I don't know? It's about Ryan's party, she says. What? Rory told me that you and Jenny are the only ones he invited. She says you're his only real friends. That's not true, Ben says. Yes, it is, she says. It's a secret. I'm going to the library to work on my report, Ben tells his mom. Don't you want to ride, she asks, looking up from her magazine. No, thanks. I'm going to take it. It's not too far. Okay, she says. Work hard. Ben slips on his backpack over his shoulders, climbs over the bike, and pedals out onto the driveway. Ten minutes later, he pulls into Ryan's driveway and leaves his bike on the grass. When he knocks on the door, Rory opens it. Ryan! Jenny! He screams. Ryan! Ben's here! Ben hears something or someone running. He reaches in his backpack and pulls out amphibians of the world. Ryan pushes Rory out of the way and swings the door wide open. Happy birthday, Ben says, holding out the book. Ryan's smile is so big, it seems like it's going to fall off his face. <gasps> cool, he says. Cool, this is so cool. Ben peers through the kitchen window. His father is pacing back and forth, something he does when he's excited or upset. His mother is leaning against the counter with her arms folded. Ben takes a deep breath and opens the back door. Is that you, Ben? His mother asks. Yeah, Ben calls, waiting for the ax to fall. Where on earth have you been? I was ready to send your father out looking for you. I've been at Ryan's house. Ryan's house? You said you were going to the library. I know. Ben, his father said, you lied to your mother. I know. I'm sorry. You were supposed to be working on your report. But I had to go to Ryan's party. I promised him I would. And why didn't we know about this party? His mother asks. I forgot to tell you. His parents look at each other like their son has lost his mind. His father shakes his head, then squeezes the bridge of his nose with his fingers. Go work on your report. We'll talk about your punishment tomorrow, his father says. But dad, but nothing. Go to your room and get busy now. I don't want to know where all this lying is coming from, but it's going to stop. Ben's cheeks are hot. He doesn't blame his parents for being mad, but he was only trying to do the right thing. Dad, Agatha bursts into the kitchen. Ben is about to tell her to get out, but he stops when he sees her face, all red and in a pout. She plants herself in the middle of the room, arms folded across her chest. I heard what you said. It's not fair, she says. Ben was just being a friend. That's enough, Agatha, Dad says. This doesn't have... Why are you punishing Ben? He messed up by not doing his report sooner. But Ryan doesn't have any friends besides Ben and Jenny. And isn't being a good friend more important than finishing a dumb report? Ben stares at his sister, not sure he heard her right. Ben has to make friends if he's going to live here. And all of his other friends are in Tucson, Agatha says. His parents are looking at each other again. His father's mouth is all twisted like he's trying not to smile. His mother looks away like she doesn't want anyone to see what she's thinking. Agatha, the twitty little sister, breaks through the parent barrier, Ben thinks. It's a miracle. Well, his mother clears her throat. Even if that is true, you still have to do your report. You promised you'd get it done tonight. Somehow, in the smallest of ways, twitty Agatha has given Ben a little breathing space. Okay, he says. As, she, or as he walks past his mom and dad, he can feel their eyes on him. When he passes Agatha, he motions for her to follow him. 
They walk down the hall together. At the door of his room, Ben turns and looks into his little sister's eyes. Thanks, Agatha, he says. That, or thanks a lot. You saved my butt in there. I know, she said. I'm a good saver. Bring your reports up, please. Wait until I call your row. Mrs. Kutcher stands at the front of the class and watches as her students file up and place their reports at the big table under the bulletin board. Thank you, class. I appreciate all your hard work and I look forward to reading each one. Now I'd like for you to sit silently for a few minutes and read tomorrow's assignment, pages 178 to 190. When everyone is reading quietly, Mrs. Kutcher motions for Ben to come back to her desk. I didn't see you hand in a report, Ben. Did you forget it and leave it at your house? I didn't finish, Ben says, keeping his head down. Why not? I gave the assignment weeks ago. Ben shrugs. I just couldn't get it done. If you needed more time, why didn't you come to me sooner? Mrs. Kutcher leans on her desk. Well, what are we going to do? Maybe I could do it this weekend. That doesn't sound very convincing. Suddenly Ryan is at Ben's side. Mrs. Kutcher, he begins. His voice is too loud, like always, and other kids can hear him. It's embarrassing, but it's too late to stop him. Not that anyone could stop him anyway. Ben wanted to do his paper, but he had to come to my party. Mrs. Kutcher's eye, Mrs. Kutcher eyes Ryan, then looks back at Ben. Jenny appears on the other side of the teacher's desk. It's true, Mrs. Kutcher. Ben promised he would go to the party, and when he said he couldn't come because he had to do his report, Ryan was really disappointed. Mrs. Kutcher looks at all of them, then stares out the window for a moment. Chewing on her bottom lip, Ben can't tell what she's thinking. Ryan and Jenny, please go sit down, she finally says. Okay, but, Ryan starts. Sit down, Ryan, Mrs. Kutcher repeats. Okay, okay, Ryan says. Mrs. Kutcher waits until Ryan and Jenny are in their seats, then looks back at Ben. You've known about this report for a long, long time. You even showed me some of your notes. I know. Why didn't you finish it? I don't know. There must have been some reason. You're so fascinated with the desert and you already know so much about it. I guess I've been doing other things and the desert just wasn't as interesting to me as I thought it was. Why didn't you say something? I don't know. I kept thinking I could get the report done. Mrs. Kutcher is quiet for a moment and then says, if you could pick another ecosystem, what would it be? Ben is afraid to say, I don't know, again. He stares at his feet. I have an idea, the teacher says, and Ben looks up. He can tell by the tone of her voice that something new, something different. Why don't you write about a habitat around here? You're new in Massachusetts, and it might even be interesting for you to find out about your new environment. Ben is astounded. Mrs. Kutcher knows more about him than he thought she did. Could she have been talking to Mrs. Tibbetts? Like what, he says. Well, what do you think? Wetlands, maybe? Swamps and ponds? Marshes, maybe? Sounds good to me, she says and smiles. Okay, he'll have to start all over, but at least she's giving him a second chance. And since you've changed topics, why don't I give you a week? It's still a lot of work to do in that time. That's great, says Ben. He feels the relief wash over him. All right, one week, that's it. And remember, I'll have to deduct points because you didn't get it done on time. Okay, thanks, Ben says. Ben rushes back to his desk before she can change her mind. Jenny, looking over at him with an eager gleam, gleam in her eyes. What happened? She's taking off points, but she's giving me another week. I'm going to do my, my report on ponds and swamps here in Massachusetts. Jenny holds up her hand for a high five. That is the end of chapter 16. I will continue with chapter 17 in the next video.